The regular broadcast of the Minneapolis Policy and Government Oversight Committee will now begin. Good afternoon. My name is Andrea Jenkins, and I am the chair of the Policy and Government Oversight Committee. And I'm going to call to order our regular um, committee meeting for Wednesday, September 22nd. I will note for the record that this meeting has remote participation by council members and city staff as authorized under the Minnesota Open Meeting Law, Section 13D.021, due to the declared state of local public health emergency. I will also note that the city will be recording and posting this meeting to the city's website and YouTube channel as a means of increasing public access and transparency. This meeting is public and subject to Minnesota Open Meeting Law. At this time, I will ask the clerk to call the roll to verify the presence of a quorum. Councilmember Reich. Here. Gordon. Here. Fletcher. Here. Cunningham. Present. Osman. Councilmember Osman. Goodman. Present. Connell. Here. Bender. Here. Schrader. Here. Johnson. Here. Palmasano. Present. Ellison. Present. Councilmember Osman. Chair Jenkins. Present. There are 12 members present. Uh, let the record reflect that we do have a quorum and I will apologize to the public and to my colleagues. I did not have my camera on initially, but I think I'm visible now. Uh, colleagues, we have 38 items on today's agenda, including two discussion items. We'll begin with the consent agenda. Um, item number one is uh, waiving the residency requirement for John Bernstein serving on the Capital Long Range Improvement Committee. Item number two approves the appointment of representatives to the Metropolitan Airports Commission's Joint Airport Zoning Board uh, for the Crystal Airport. Um, item number three approves and ranks uh, the 2022 capital budget request and authorizes the submittal of those requests to the Commissioner of Management and Budget. Item number four designates polling places for the 2021 municipal election. Item number five authorizes contracts. And I'm sorry, contracts with clear housing for housing opportunities for persons living with AIDS. Um, or HAPWA programming. Item number six is a right away of reconveyance agreement with the Main Street Property Management for 815 and a half 25th Avenue South. Item number seven is a contract with MII Life Incorporated doing business as further. Um, for health reimbursement, flexible spending account, and transportation administration services. Item number eight authorizes contract negotiations and a non-disclosure agreement with the US, with US Solar for the purchase of renewable electricity credits. Item number nine is a contract amendment with Clearway Energy LLC for distribution of streamed chilled water. I'm sorry, of steamed and chill water. Item number 10 is a contract with Garda World Security Corporation, DBA as best for security services at the Minneapolis Convention Center. Item number 11 is accepting a bid for Target Center Kitchen 219 food service equipment. 
um, item number 12 is accepting a bid for mailing services for utility billing. Item number 13 is a request for proposal proposals for legal services panel for 2022 through 2024. Items 14 through 36 are legal settlements. And I will note that for the record, at future policy and government oversight committee meetings, the finance department will be presenting with us a presentation on the overall data on workers' compensation claims. With that, does it, do any of my colleagues wish to uh, comment and or pull any of these items for discussion? Um, anyone? All right, seeing none, um, I will go ahead and ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilmember Reich. Aye. Gordon. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Cunningham. Aye. Osman. Aye. Goodman. Aye. Connell. Aye. Bender. Aye. Schrader. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Palmasano. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Chair Jenkins. Aye. There are 13 ayes. I will that item uh, passes and I will note for the record that we have been joined by Council Member Osmond. Council Member, if you can just um, say something for the record so we can record your presence. Council Member Osmond, are you here? Okay, well, we'll just continue to move forward. Um, and the next item on our agenda is um, item number 37. It's a report back from staff on the Hiawatha Maintenance Facility Campus Expansion. And I will invite um, Interim Director Brett Jelly um, to begin that report, along with Barbara O'Brien, Director of Property Services. Thank you, Chair Jenkins. I will, I note that uh, Councilmember Cano did put her name in the chat. So I, I, just, I just noticed that. Thank you, uh, Mr. Jelly. Uh, Councilmember Cano. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and I, I'd be happy to get your help on um, uh, navigating the meeting here. I do have a motion uh, that I shared with colleagues earlier today, um, and my motion uh, that I would like to make now is to move to postpone for one cycle uh, the consideration of the staff direction related to the Hiawatha maintenance facility, um, the campus expansion, to the next regularly scheduled policy and government oversight committee, which is scheduled for Wednesday, October 6th. <clears throat> Second. Thank you, Councilmember Cano. We do have a motion um, to delay, to postpone this item for one cycle um, and a proper second. Is there any discussion? Councilmember Reich. Uh, thank you, Madam Vice President. Um, knowing that the nature of what is to be reported to us would not in any way change um, in form or substance, um, I'm not really seeing the merit of any delay. It's not like when we usually delay, it's to modify a project or discuss some nuance to a policy discussion. This is actually a straightforward report that we instructed staff to present. And so I'd like to present a substitute motion that we proceed um, as indicated in our previous um, direction.
Uh, thank you, Councilmember Wright. We now have a um, a substitute motion. Um, is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion on this motion? Council President Binder. Thanks, Madam Chair. I, I do think um, that at the very least it's beneficial to be able to hear from staff given that they've postponed other work to be able to be ready to present today. Um, so I, I support Council Member Riggs um, motion to go ahead and hear from staff today. Thank you, Council Member Bender. Council Member Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I believe the intent from Council Member Cano's uh, motion is it's, there is, as one of the authors around the staff direction, there is ongoing work with staff uh, at, at the request of staff to have more time uh, around discussing some concerns with the language so that it can be resolved. So I don't think that there's necessarily a conflict between having a presentation today from staff, but still taking up uh, a motion to hold over one cycle the staff direction um, so that language can be improved that the authors are working on. And so I would uh, say maybe given that there's a substitute here on holding this over a cycle, there's an opportunity to kind of sort this out so we can still have the presentation today while also um, having a more refined staff direction that is sensitive to uh, concerns around how it is written. So I don't see these things as uh, mutually excluded or in conflict with one another. And so I wanted to throw that out there and see if we can sort that out. Thank you, Council Member Johnson. Uh, um, Council President Bender. Yeah, thanks. I, I don't know if members of the public who may be watching this or even council members know what's going on because we haven't had the staff presentation. So I just maybe echoing part of what Council Member Johnson says, I think it would be beneficial to hear from staff who are responding to direction from council to come and present so that we may then decide how to proceed, whether it's with delay or decision today. Thank you, Council President Binder. Are there any, is there more discussion? Others? Councilmember Johnson. Thank you, Madam Vice President. So I don't know if the uh, two different folks with uh, motions are willing to withdraw them, Councilmember Reich and Councilmember Cano, so that we can hear from staff and then there can be an opportunity for a motion around uh, postponing a cycle, any any sort of staff direction thereafter. That would be one potential solution. And I see Councilmember Reich in queue. Thank you for that suggestion, Councilmember Johnson, Councilmember Wright. Councilmember Wright, you. are you there? Nope, nope, just a little difficulty. Thank you, um, Madam Vice President. Now the intention of my motion was specifically to hear uh, the report from staff as we directed them. Uh, certainly we can take any subsequent actions to them, uh, but to preemptively delay is exactly the nature of my motion. So I would encourage everyone from this conversation to approve what I submitted um, and we can hear the report and whatever subsequent actions we take, we take. Uh, but the spirit of mine is let the staff proceed with what we directed them to do today. And I hope I have support so we can have that conversation and hear the report. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Wright. Is there any other discussion? Councilmember Connell. Thank you, um, Madam um, Chair. Um, so I guess I should just maybe share a little bit more details about the legislative process that we're in, um, in case that there's questions from council members who are um, 
wanting to know sort of what, where, where this item lives in our um, legislative body. So um, you might remember that we took a, a vote to um, suspend the, uh, the public works expansion and to authorize um, specific, um, I guess, uh, additions to the existing uh, campus in East Phillips. Um, some of that includes building a parking ramp, um, some of it includes uh, developing some some shop bays and, and essentially, you know, trying to get the current existing campus to, um, <clears throat> I guess, serve our employees a little bit better. Um, and then the other piece was, I think, the, the more uh, significant piece to the community, which is to, to suspend uh, the expansion of, of the Hiawatha campus into the additional seven acres that are located um, in the Arsenic Triangle, an area known um, as um, uh, the East Phillips uh, neighborhood. And so um, because that item did not have a fiscal note, and a racial equity impact analysis, the item stayed alive in Pogo um, and was waiting for this meeting to uh, to be bundled with that fiscal note and the um, racial equity impact analysis. Um, however, what we're finding out is that the, this action needs to be yet again bundled with um, a bigger conversation about uh, what is the, the future of the site um, and how, how the racial equity impact analysis takes into consideration the, um, the building of a parking ramp at this transit oriented development site, as well as um, the future uh, development that the, um, the community would like to be able to build here. Um, so we've been in uh, robust conversations with city staff, elected officials, um, community members, the union, um, the trades union, <clears throat> excuse me, to try to figure out how we can really kind of couple all of these pieces together and present uh, a full picture of uh, the conversation. And so um, I, I'm, o I'm okay with us um, hearing from staff about the racial equ equity impact analysis and the fiscal note as a point of information, but I wouldn't want us to uh, approve any, any type of um, official direction on those pieces until we have the complete package ready. And so um, in conversations with the city attorney and other um, internal uh, leaders on this, um, you know, it, it became clear that there's some sort of growing conversations about um, partnerships between the community, the city and the labor unions around some of these issues and the future of the site that could um, beneficially um, uh, improve the, the, the tone of the conversation that we've been having in terms of the, the legal liability the city might uh, face with this and, and some other pieces. And so um, the real intent here is not nefarious, which I'm, I'm kind of picking that up from some of the conversation from other colleagues here. It's not to hide information. It's not to be preemptive. It's really to say we have a really good level of work happening and we just need a couple of more days to really land it and be able to offer our colleagues and the public a full package of information. Um, so that that was really the, the intent of, of the motion to delay by one cycle. Uh, I don't think anybody uh, feels uh, bad about having a little bit more time to, to land some of these conversations. I think um, many staff have expressed that they're working under multiple heavy deadlines and um, they want to be responsible and provide information when we can, uh, but they also know how complicated this conversation is. Um, and elected officials, you know, on our and, um, you know, I know there's a few calls into Councilmember Goodman to talk about this project and, um, you know, a, a lot of the leaders at Little Earth really want to be able to engage her on this and get her expertise um, and guidance on this conversation. And then, you know, we we were able to reach some colleagues on this on Monday and Tuesday, but not everyone. So we're, we're trying to sort of thread the needle of, of just being able to, to have a, a complete package together, uh, well enough baked conversation where people are feeling feeling comfortable about um, their questions and ideas. Um, so I, I guess, you know, 
that's that's just kind of the context I wanted to share, uh, just so it, it, it's not, um, I guess, uh, painted as, you know, me trying to be shifty or, you know, lying or something. Um, it's really just to try to get more information to the table in one um, fell swoop so that we can look at the entire picture and not have to make decisions in, in a siloed uh, way around this particular very complicated and high profile topic. All right, thank you, uh, Councilmember Cano, uh, Councilmember Reich. Councilmember Reich, if you are speaking, you are on mute. Sorry, just these buttons seem to be a little sticky today. Um, thank you, Madam Vice President. The um, intent here is just to, as many people seem to be interested in, is to have the report that we asked for. There's nothing in these reports that will change with any subsequent conversation. Obviously, what we do moving forward on the broader conversation about, you know, a site development, um, definitely want to not curtail that conversation, uh, but I do think to proceed, we just move forward, have the presentation as directed, and we can talk about those other things too. Nothing preclude, nothing about this precludes those conversations as, as outlined by Council Mercano or others. And um, just to clarify my intent, and I don't think I said anything about anyone else's intentions, thanks. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, Council President Binder. I don't think I have anything to add. Um, perhaps it's worth just noting that the final action that the city council as a body has taken on this was in 2018 when the city council and mayor unanimously directed staff to do essentially what's option A. And so there have been many, many conversations using up an enormous amount of staff time to try to change that decision recently. but. Um, that is the final decision that the City Council has made. Um, the actions that have been held over in committee are not final because the Council didn't act on them. Thank you. All righty. Um, if there's no further discussion, we can take a roll call on the substitute motion offered by council member Reich. And I will ask the clerk to call the roll. Council member Reich. Aye. Gordon. No. Fletcher. Aye. Cunningham. Aye. Osman. Aye. Goodman. Aye. Cano. No. Bender. Aye. Schrader. No. Johnson. No. Palmasano. No. Ellison. Aye. Chair Jenkins. No. There are seven ayes and six nays. All right, so that Item carries. I would like to ask the clerk. This was a substitute motion, so we will be hearing the staff report. But do we need to? We still have a motion on the floor. Should that vote happen after the presentation? Chair Jenkins, can they have the clerk's office? I see Peggy just turned her camera on too, but. I, I, my understanding is it's the body's intent to hear the presentation. So I think that kind of um, negates council member Cano's motion at this point. So I think after you hear the presentation, it would be appropriate for her to make the motion again if, if she wants to, but I, I think you can just move forward with the presentation at this point. Yes, I, I agree that we can move forward with the presentation, but but her motion was properly seconded. So, I mean, it. It's a standing motion. It's, it doesn't need to be restated, in my 
opinion, but maybe I'm not as versed in Robert's rules as some other folks. I, I think that's fine. If you want to just hear the presentation and then assume that uh, her motion is still on the floor and take it up as soon as the presentation is over, I think that would be appropriate. All right, thank you. I will invite um, Interim Director Jelly back to the virtual stage to uh, present the presentation along with uh, Director O'Brien. Thank you, Chair Jenkins. Uh, I am Brett Jelly, the Interim Director of Public Works. And uh, the debate that just happened uh, actually stepped on many of my introductory points, so I will I will be brief. Um, the item before you today is the Hiawatha Maintenance Facility Campus Expansion. I am joined by a number of my colleagues uh, who are here to answer questions if needed. This has been a team effort. It includes Heather Johnson, City Coordinator, Barbara O'Brien, Director of Property Services, Eric Hansen, Director of Economic Development, Kim Havey, the Sustainability Director, and finally, Eric Nelson, Deputy City Attorney. And as we have pre uh, presented the project recently, I'll limit my remarks to just a short project recap. Uh, as uh, has been described, the purpose of the Hiawatha Maintenance Facility Campus expansion includes elements of replacing a 100 year old and substandard water distribution facility, uh, are consolidating our surface water and sewer division staff who are in multiple locations today, and then improving the overall site operations uh, for what is the home to our crews and employees who provide uh, the basic city services such as drinking water system maintenance, snow plowing, pothole patching, sewer maintenance and many other uh, activities. Short project recap, uh, as was noted, uh, the idea of this project has been around since the 1990s. The city did purchase the property in 2016 and uh, approved a master plan uh, in 2018. And that approval set the full project in motion uh, until the council voted on April 30th to suspend the work and directed staff to report back to the council on alternatives and costs. And then on August 18th, the council uh, uh, committee did approve a staff direction related to implementing option C2, which uh, describing that uh, is stopping all aspects of any expansion onto the roof depot property, uh, but also moving forward with some of the improvements on the existing site. And because uh, that action was taken at committee, but there was not a uh, racial equity impact analysis or fiscal note, it was referred to staff uh, for the completion of those two items. They have been uh, uploaded and attached uh, with the request for council action and updated request for council action. And I would like to, uh, the in particular, the fiscal note um, is, a, it looks a little bit different than the standard fiscal note. So I am going to introduce uh, City Coordinator Heather Johnston and then Eric Hansen, the Director of Economic Development, to give an overview uh, of that document. Madam Chair, uh, members of the Council, uh, Heather Johnston, Interim City Coordinator. I'm pinch hitting for Dushani Dai, um, who is out of the office today. Uh, I'm going to pick the, I'm going to take the big piece of the fiscal note and then I'm going to turn to Eric Hansen to discuss all of the holding cost pieces. Um, the largest portion of the fiscal impact is the $12.9 million repayment of the water fund. Um, this would be required uh, before this property is developed. I do want to just mention that number has increased slightly from the 12.3 that was discussed earlier and that is primarily due to the design work that began um, back in after this project was approved in uh, December of 2018. And so we've gotten the final bills and payment for that design work. Um, and Barbara O'Brien can certainly speak to that in more detail. Um, just for order of magnitude, folks, uh, if folks wanted the $12.9 million increase, um, if you wanted to have that repaid through a property tax levy, it would be a, an increase of 3.25% uh, over the mayor's budget proposal of 5.45%. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Eric Hansen, and then we will both be available for questions. 
Thank you, Heather. Uh, Madam Vice President, uh, members of the committee, my name is Eric Hansen. I'm the Director of Economic Policy and Development for the city, and I'm just um, going to go over some things we talked about the I think a few meetings ago about what your options would be with the property if we were to, as a city, decide not to use the roof depot um, properties. And you have about four options in front of you, and they have different um, uh, price tags to them, and that's uh, in detail in the fiscal note. Most notably, as as uh, the interim coordinator said, it, we would need the $12.9 million paid off before it could be moved from a public facility into the redevelopment authority that CPED oversees for the city. Um, and then you have four options. The first option is to sell it as surplus property, and that would be sold at public bid, and that's a sealed bid. And the drawbacks to a public bid is is that the city would have limited oversight of what happens to the property afterwards outside of its land use controls, um, but it would cost, you know, it would net out a cost somewhere between, you know, six and a half to nine million dollars um, of total cost. So it would bring down the the cost of the water fund uh, from that 12.9 down, you know, depending on how much we would get. Uh, the other option is uh, three redevelopment options, and those range in prices after you take out the 12.9 to very minimal expenses to up to about, you know, four and a half, four and a half million dollars up front with, you know, some operating expenses over time. And those three are a low maintenance option, which we would do a redevelopment. We just let the property sit the way it has been sitting uh, for the last few years. Um, that would, you know, have minimal costs. We wouldn't have to make any improvements to the site uh, until it's redeveloped, and then, and then we would do things like, um, you know, snow removal and that sort of thing. So very de minimis expenses to the city. The second um, is to just clear the site, remove it, um, take out the environmental contamination that's that, that's at the site, and encapsulate the site. That would cost about four point three million dollars. Um, to do that initial work, and then about $125,000 over time, just to oh, oh, per year, just to maintain it. Um, and then the third one, which would be probably the most expensive because of ongoing expenses, um, would be to preserve the building, and that would be making some envelope improvements, putting in a heating plant, fixing some things in the roof. That'd be about four million dollars, and then that has a uh, longer and more expensive tail to it because it's about $250,000 per year. In annual expenses because we'd have to heat and cool the building, provide a, so, some additional security measures um, and some other property maintenance. Um, so that's that's your more expensive and that's just getting you to the end of the development process. We have not quantified staff time to do the process, nor have we um, estimated how much of a subsidy or public investment that would be needed in the ultimate redevelopment project. So those would still be costs. And as we said in, in the last few meetings, um, that is based on this kind of property, it's going to take a while for the redevelopment to occur, and we expect that it's going to be pretty expensive from a city standpoint for investment, considering the community, um, the community perspective around the community supported uh, development. We think that there's going to be a need to uh, amass multiple public sources in order for us to uh, make this a reality. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thanks everyone for that presentation. Um, are there any questions for Mr. Hansen or Ms. O'Brien? I, I will note that, that was a lot of detailed information to digest um, verbally. Um, but I don't see any further questions or comments. Um, Interim Director Jelly, is is that the extent of the presentation? Uh, I just would like to note, um, and, and as my understanding, when other items have been directed um, to come back for the uh, completion of a RIA and uh, racial equity impact analysis and the fiscal note. Um, they've been done and we've 
Uh, staff has come back and, and uh, they were attached, they're noted when the agenda was posted for public review. I, uh, Kim Havey, uh, sustainability director is uh, here and can um, uh, answer questions or also provide uh, some high points um, summary of that work as well. I'll, I'll kind of uh, Council Vice President Jenkins uh, offer those choices to you. Um, we can just as necessary. I would, um, I think would like to hear from you, uh, Mr. Havey, but prior to that, uh, there's a comment question from Council President Bender. Thanks, Madam Chair. I was pausing because I think my question may have some sort of legal implications and I, I know we have, um, you know, it's a bit difficult sometimes for us to talk through legal risk to the city in a public forum. Um, you know, to your point, we heard a lot of information verbally. Um, you know, I think there's this piece in the fiscal impact analysis that is worth noting, which is that the, um, and so maybe this is a way to ask this question, Right now, the fiscal impact analysis indicates that the way to close the funding gap um, that was identified by staff, if the um, option C was was the final decision, so this $12.9 million gap, um, the, the identified way to do that here is a, an 8.7% tax levy in 2022. Um, but my understanding is that we can't be certain that that would allow us to, um, so, so that is how we are complying with showing that we would be paying back the fund, but the, um, fiscal impact analysis, um, also, you know, notes, um, the sort of different customer bases that the Waterworks Fund both collects fees from as well as serves, which includes all of Minneapolis, but also 22% of those sales go to suburban customers. Um, so we know that um, there is there is some legal risk to the city um, related to the, the speed with which we would be paying back the water fund. Is um, so I guess the question to staff, maybe Ms. Johnston is the best person or, and or the city attorney's office, to just clarify that um, um, the, the fiscal impact analysis outlines a way that we can pay back the water fund, which would be an, an 8.6% levy and 8.7% levy increase in 2022. Um, I won't be in office um, then. I, it's hard for me to imagine this us city council and mayor approving an 8.7% levy increase in 2022. So, um, there appears to be some potential financial and legal risk. Uh, thank you, Council President Bender. Um, to that end, uh, we have Assistant City Attorney um, available to address that issue. Sure. Uh, thank you, Council Vice President Jenkins, Council President Bender, Eric Nelson, Deputy City Attorney. The Council President accurately stated uh, uh, at least uh, the legal perspective on the issue of replenishment of the water fund. Um, in terms of the mechanics and the method for how the fund is replenished, I, I, I would need to defer to finance and or the city coordinator, but the advice from um, city Attorney's Office, our advice is that if it is the will of the city to walk from a, a city facilities project or a water project, the there is a, a corresponding need to replenish the water fund as soon as possible to minimize legal risk and exposure. And in our discussions, the the method identified, it, it, you know, it is the method that would accomplish that need based on the scale of the repayment needed um, to do that. So your 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 recitation was correct, Council President. Thank 
you, Mr. Nielsen. Um, Council member Connell. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think that that some of these, um, you know, suggestions and and conversations coming from Council Member Bender are premature. Um, and and we don't have to be reminded a hundred times about the vote that the city council took on this project. Everyone can read. We can all pull up the old records and understand that for ourselves. Um, so I think we should spend our time constructively trying to problem solve around this. And um, I think what Mr. Nilsson has shared with us is, um, you know, the the current action that we have right now is to suspend the project. Um, that can be interpreted as we need some time to figure out what we wanna do with the future of this project. And what I was trying to explain earlier today that perhaps that I failed at explaining um, is that we are trying to figure that out and we need a few more days to be able to bring a full package to our colleagues here to consider. Um, We've been having lots of meetings and conversations about this over the last seven days. Um, we need to be able to just kind of close out those conversations with some of these new players and new opportunities that are coming up on this particular um, lot and project. And so the, the information that is being shared here today is incomplete. Um, it is not a true reflection of the conversations we're having right now. <clears throat> and that's why I think it's important that this particular discussion be uh, tabled and be brought up in full light at the next POGO meeting on Wednesday, October 6th, because the current um, conversation that has uh, been, I guess, I don't know, captured in the um, RIA and the uh, fiscal note um, are only reflecting one third of the pieces of the pie here. And so I, I think that it would be wrong to assume that there's a levy increase conversation on the table. Um, that is not anything the co-authors are talking about that, that engage the staff direction, nor the colleagues who are considering supporting this effort. I think that's a, a premature um, uh, proposition and it is an incomplete analysis of the situation that we have before us. And so once again, I, I would love to be able to uh, table this motion and we'll, um, I, I, you know, I, it's unclear to me if this presentation is over or not. I want to be respectful of the people who wanted to get the incomplete information today and you can keep having this in, incomplete discussion, uh, but, but I would uh, like to be able to make a motion to, to delay and be able to get all the pieces together uh, for the uh, October 6th meeting that is already slated on the books for our next POGO conversation. Thank you, Council Member Connell. Um, Interim Director Jelly, is, are we complete with the presentation? Yes. Uh, Council Vice President Jenkins, uh, we we can wrap up. I'll note, um, I think. I mean, if there's more, please, please share. I'm just not sure where we are in the process. That's yes, and I, I want to clarify one thing. We, uh, the POGO committee passed um, two actions, and, and so that is what was referred to staff and what we completed the racial equity impact analysis on and the fiscal note, of course, if the council if the committee takes uh, other actions moving forward and, and those uh, documents are required, we of course will will do that. But we did we did complete uh, these two items based on what went what was approved by uh, Pogo committee. Um, I will uh, I'll introduce Kim Havey, uh, sustainability director, to give a couple of uh, some highlights from the racial equity impact analysis document, and then uh, that will conclude our presentation. Thank you. Um... Interim Director Jelly, and I will con confirm your assertion that we that this report is based on the um, directions given by the members of this committee, and so you're absolutely accurate. We did not ask for anything beyond that, and you staff has has delivered, uh, Mr. Haby. Thank you, Council Vice President Jenkins. Uh, my name is Kim Havey. I'm Director of Sustainability, and uh, myself, Kelly Mullman, um, and uh, the other uh, directors who are on this call related to this project all participated in um, developing 
uh, a racial equity impact analysis in which um, has been stated. We looked at two uh, aspects of the project. One um, was implementing the option C2, which included the uh, construction of an office addition shop bays and modified parking structure um, that uh, we, we looked at what impacts might be of suspending the city's work um, uh, to expand the Hiawatha facility. Um, and then uh, the fiscal note, of course, providing uh, one time versus annual activities of cost of maintaining the city owned property. So I just wanted to quickly kind of walk through some of the findings. This is uh, has been included in your um, packet uh, for uh, the Hiawatha project. But as you can see, our, just walking through the form, our policy goals on this public services, obviously this is very related uh, to the support of a lot of uh, um, work that our public works water department does in repairing and maintaining all of our systems and uh, providing clean water throughout um, the city as well as the region. This also has um, a designated environmental justice uh, zone, a green zone that does encompass the entire project site. Um, and so it requires us to really take a much closer look at to what the, uh, the impacts may be to the community. And in this area also what the cumulative impacts um, will be uh, in this community and how it affects um, people of color um, and others who have already borne a significant impact of pollution uh, in the past from, from decisions that were made and, and continue to be uh, made around the project site. Um, operational goals, uh, uh, workforce obviously is a huge part of this. There are hundreds of employees the city has here. And of course there's the intent to uh, have a, a workforce training center um, and um, that kind of thing. But depending on how the project moves forward, um, what will happen with that is uncertain. So one of the things that should be noted is that um, this particular area, um, when it comes down to the racial breakdown of the community, we looked at East Phillips and then as Minneapolis as a whole. Uh, the racial breakdown here shows that 71.2% of the residents in East Phillips are people of color. In Minneapolis, that's 36.4 uh, on an average basis. Um, we also have 38% uh, being Hispanic or Latino compared to the city of 9.6% and 30% of uh, the residents are foreign born as compared to the city at 15.6%. Um, we also have uh, a higher unemployment rate in this area and a lower median income. Um, so median income is at 30, 39,271 uh, for the East Phillips median income in the city on average as a whole is 62,583. Um, one of the things that we did provide in here is also to take a look at what is a what we consider a proxy for air quality um, and environmental health, which is asthma levels. These asthma levels can be um, very easily, not easily, but uh, can be obtained through uh, a regular data sources that track this. Um, so while it's not a perfect example of what the air quality is, um, it is a proxy for the potential effects of poor air quality, which are sort of backed up with, with actual air quality data from the MPCA. But what we find is that, you know, asthma levels um, in uh, amongst the 55404 zip code um, are 307 uh, emergency uh, visits per uh, 10,000 as compared to the average for Minnesota, 119. Um, and for all ages um, in the metropolitan area, we've got 40.9 visits um, uh, compared to 176.5 visits in 554, 55404 area code. So you can see that the amount of emergency visits related to asthma are four times higher uh, in this zip code than they are in the seven county metro area and more than four times higher than what is um, average for the entire uh, state. Um, there have been specific um, air quality monitoring that has gone on, um, focusing on benzene, uh, formaldehyde, particulate matter 2.5. I'll just quickly highlight that um, this uh, census block area has the highest uh, amount of PM 2.5 levels or highest 10% of PM 2.5 uh, levels in the entire state. So 90% of the state has lower PM 2.5 levels. Um, and that a lot of this is contributing from traffic, um, but there's also permitted facilities that make up around 20% of those particular emissions uh, areas as well too. 
So in conclusion, the summary of sort of the data that's there is that um, the data indicates that residents living in the neighborhood around the project site, which has a majority of BIPOC residents, experience much higher levels of cumulative pollution than residents from majority white city neighborhoods and the average metro area resident, leading to higher levels of asthma and hospitalization for children and adults living in the surrounding neighborhoods. <clears throat> the Minneapolis 24 comprehensive plan and green zones goals and work plans to call for the mitigation of disproportionate environmental impacts on communities of color, not only to not increase harm, but to actively decrease harm and to do so in collaboration with community uh, members. And these plans were generated with thresh and input from residents uh, across Minneapolis, including many in, in uh, East Phillips. Um, I guess I'll just talk briefly about um, there's a, quite a bit of work that has been done on, on community engagement. Um, there's a list of kind of the engagements and learnings that have been happening between 2016 and 2018. Um, there's also been two advisory committees that have been set up uh, and have had met. Um, one was site guideline advisory committee in 2017 and then the Hiawatha advisory committee in 2019. Um, several sort of overall themes emerged from those meeting with residents. Um, one is to have a desire to have agency or involvement in the planning and decision making for the site. Preference for the C's engagement with the community have started sooner. Uh, concerns about increasing traffic and traffic related pollution in a community that already has um, some of the highest levels, as I mentioned, of pollution in Minneapolis and the Minnesota. Um, a vision for deindustrializing uh, the neighborhood. Opportunities for youth recreation, activating a job training, employment and entrepreneurship opportunities for BIPOC residents, an interest in solar, sustainable energy to reduce residents' energy burden and create career, green career pathways, um, creating a community designation with connections to history, culture and connectivity to the Greenway and light rail transit and to access healthy food gardens and cultivation. As you know, you've also been receiving a lot of um, emails. I know uh, I received those emails as well too um, from community residents and others um, in regards to this. So there's been um, uh, quite a few uh, residents who have voiced their opinions on this um, in support of uh, EPICS projects and others. Um, and then uh, I'll just touch on sort of the analysis piece um, where we looked at the various different components of what would be considered sort of a uh, uh, positive impact, a negative impact, and an unknown impact on those changes. And rather than go through all of those um, specifically in detail, I would just like to encourage you to take a look at that because we did break it down um, into the development on site, which include buildings A, B, and C, which are those service bays, the office expansion, parking lot, and kind of what the, the positives and negatives of those are. Um, and then uh, we also looked at um, what the uh, impacts might be in delaying the expansion of the Hiawatha maintenance facility um, and what the impact would be um, in regards to those um, changes that were made or additions. Um, and then really just taking a look at um, the impact of retaining the roof depot structure as it is, um, but not doing any development of it, but in regards to um, uh, the either restoration of contaminated soils, those that, that would not happen. Um, uh, and then also the improvements to uh, the, the area around there with additional green space uh, and additional infrastructure and spreading out the uh, traffic flow amongst the, uh, the overall large site. But again, we didn't look into um, anything comparable to what EPIC has proposed. We didn't have that in a staff direction. So this is really just looking at the parts that were approved to go forward and what the impact would be on the uh, community um, of not moving forward with the site and having it stay as is. So um, that's how we looked at it. I think this is a, a pretty comprehensive uh, review um, of it. Obviously, this is, is a one where there is not a conclusion or support one way or another on how this goes. But what the racial equity impact analysis is doing is bringing data about the impact on, on uh, uh, BIPOC communities looking at the health uh, indicators from those communities and then determining uh, how best to move forward, knowing what the other policies uh, that we have in place are, such as our environmental justice green zones and um, our uh, declarations around um, ra uh, uh, ra 
racial or racism as a public health issue, those kind of things, that needs to be taken in consider consideration when um, deciding how to proceed uh, with whatever uh, proposal might come forward. But this provides at least an overview of what the what what is there in the community today, and what we see as potential impacts um, based on the the previous uh, council direction to staff. So I'll be happy to answer any questions uh, on on the RIA. Thank you. Great. Um, are there any questions for Director Haiti? Council President Bender. Thanks, yeah. Madam Chair. I think this may be um, one of the first presentations we've had in detail of one of the RIAs. I really appreciated the level of detail here. I did want to note that one thing I think has been a kind of topic of um, conversation over the years of this project is that um, certainly we know this part of the city is a place um, where there are um, concentrated impacts of air quality issues. It's harder, as the RIA notes, to determine the um, impact of, of not doing this project here because um, it's because it would need to be compared to what else would be there instead. And so I just wanted to highlight, highlight that part of the RIA because it's been such a focus of a lot of the constituent comments and, and um, communications that we've gotten is that um, you know, a side by side comparison of this use versus other uses hasn't isn't really part of this analysis. Um, and that would need to be done in comparison with other uses. So, for example, apartment buildings have emissions um, impacts, commercial buildings have emissions impacts, office buildings have emissions impacts, you know, any kind of use that would have people coming and going have emissions impacts from transportation uses at the very least. Um, and then certainly the building energy things would need to be evaluated based on um, specific proposals. So anyway, I, I know I am talking about a very um, specific detail, but it is the subject. I, I, I just want to say I take to heart the communications we're getting, and I really appreciate the work that staff has done to try to answer some of these questions. I don't want to just ignore the substance of this issue. Um, and wanted to just highlight that piece of it. And of course, I, my colleagues, of course, have the very detailed um, notes. Um, but as staff noted, there's there's very specific kind of plus minus question marks about all of these different issues that's in the written version that's available um, through the LIMS system on our agenda, as well as that was circulated to council offices. Thanks. Thanks, Madam President. Uh, council Member Cano. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just wanted to check in. Is the uh, presentation complete now? Do we have uh, any more? Council Vice President uh, Jenkins, Council Member Cano, I, I don't believe we have any more as a team to be delivering, but uh, if if uh, we do, I'll defer to uh, 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 Interim Director Brett Jelly if there is anything else, but I am completed with my presentation. Um, I guess I would ask Mr. Haiti, is there um because a num a lot of the communication that we have been receiving characterizes an expansion uh, of the water maintenance facility as extraordinarily toxic. Um, is is that the findings of the Ria and or and I know you didn't exactly look at you only looked at expanding partially, but is are you able to comment on that at all? Um, again, it's sort of count, uh, Council Vice President Jenkins. It's um, it's difficult to 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 do that without having some comparison to it. Um, I will say that uh, there isn't anything in here that in maybe a different location would not be considered to be um, adding to the problem. The issue that we have here is that we're already in a, in a, in a location that has um, significant impacts from uh, air pollution, air quality, much of it comes from traffic, but anything in addition um, that would add additional 
cum to the cumulative level of pollution, which almost any project would in this area that contains a uh, you know high level of, of additional traffic, for example, or the use of additional diesel equipment or trucks or things like that um, makes the situation worse. Um, and um, part of our goals is to reduce the overall harm. So ideally, you'd like to reduce the overall uh, pollution effects. Um, what project will do that or will any project be able to sort of uh, reduce the uh, impacts um, that is yet to be sort of assessed um, but nonetheless that this is a, a location for many reasons including vulnerability assessment to heat uh, high heat or to heat extremes um, to localize flooding um, as well as much poor air quality than the city and, and metropolitan and state as a whole means that we do need to take extra care and hence why the racial equity impact analysis has been done. It's not determining a recommendation in one way or another. It's just giving you the uh, base objective facts. Um, and that is that this area does have a high, uh, high population of BIPOC people uh, who also have uh, endured both in the long term and short term, um, much higher levels than the average of, of air pollution. So anything we do here that doesn't reduce that, um, uh, you know, uh, needs to be compared to to what it needs to have a comparison to something. If nothing's happening compared to something that does happen, to really be able to have a true analysis done. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Havey. And you know, as you were speaking, it it just you know, came back to my mind that we are in the midst of a pandemic that is a respiratory disease that we don't have any idea when we are going to overcome those challenges. Councilmember Fletcher. Thank you, Council Vice President. And I, I also just wanted to uh, compliment uh, Mr. Havey and, and Interim Director Jelly and everybody on the this work. I think it's really valuable um, and it's a good example of the complexity of doing race equity work, right? Because when we do this work, uh, a lot of the things that we do are going to have both positive and negative impacts. And I think presenting those things together uh, so that we, we as policymakers can weigh uh, the various impacts of different paths is is really valuable. And this is the first time I think that we've seen really written down clearly uh, a, a point that I think continues to be very, very important that um, a part of the water yard proposal was uh, contamination cleanup uh, and removal of arsenic from the soil and groundwater and that we have to weigh uh, the significant cleanup benefit uh, of uh, a proposed project uh, uh, against uh, you know the the effects of of some increased traffic that would probably come from uh, as council president bender and and council vice president jenkins both noted uh, any kind of project would generate some amount of uh of of traffic and and that the stormwater filtration question especially at a time when we are seeing more and more intense storms uh, as a result of climate change uh the combination of uh an area that's susceptible to flooding and an area that has substantial arsenic in the groundwater is really dangerous uh, for communities and it's something that we have to take seriously alongside uh, air quality concerns and everything else. And so I, I really appreciate having this level of detail so that the public and everybody can, uh, you know, really wrestle with uh, a sometimes contradictory set of facts um, where there, there are aspects of this project that uh, uh, even even as it's as Council Vice President Jenkins said, being portrayed as toxic uh, actually had substantial environmental benefit, uh, and I think that that's uh, you know worth noting alongside uh, the uh, air quality concerns. Thank you, Councilmember Fletcher, and and thank you uh, again, Mr. Haby, and to all the staff. Uh, Interim Director Jelly. Is there more you need, you want to um, present as a part of this presentation? Uh, Council Vice President Jenkins, that concludes our presentation. Thank you so much. Um, so we are, I believe, back to the original motion. Um, 
which I, th I think the intent was to postpone action today, not necessarily the presentation. Um, but if if I am mistaken, then um, Councilmember Cano, uh, please please correct me, and I would just ask for a little more assistance from the clerk. Are we? Do we need to um, bring forward a new motion, or are we able to discuss and vote on the original motion? Council Vice President Jenkins, the original motion is still on the floor to postpone for one cycle. Thank you. Is there any discussion on that item issue? Uh, Council Member Reich. Thank you, uh, Madam Vice President. And uh, again, as my colleagues have stated, very appreciative of the report uh, that was requested of staff and the information that it entailed. Um, and given the level of discussion that we've had on the different proposals and a lot of the citizen input that has uh, preceded today's conversation, I'm going to offer uh, an alternative motion that um, accepts the report that we requested today and then further instruct staff um, with a motion uh, staff direction that I believe I've submitted uh, previously to the clerk and hopefully got distributed thereby um, in terms of the high wealth and maintenance facility and campus expansion. And uh, if I may, um, it basically directs staff in finance, property services, public works, community planning and economic development in the Office of Sustainability um, in alignment with the city's Southside Green Zones policy and city resolutions declaring racism a public health emergency and the city's resolution establishing a truth and reconciliation process to one, implement um, option B presented at the city council committee of the whole meeting on August 5th, 2021 by continuing with the Hiawatha campus expansion uh, with the exception of the outreach and training facility and new central business. Um, before I read further to, um, I thought this was submitted to the clerk's office. Um, I will submit it upon finishing the reading of it. I uh, report back to the City Council uh, POA Committee on or before December 8, 2021. Um, actually, in fact, I want to strike that report back to the City Council's uh, Business Inspections License and Zoning Committee before uh, November 30th, 2021. Uh, with a proposed process for setting aside the land associated with the outreach and training facility and new central stores building approximately 3.8 acres southwest corner of the city owned site bordered by 28th Street, Longfellow Avenue, 27th Street for sale uh, the community uses. Uh, this report will include the process and how to achieve the following components with a, a community engagement plan to be developed with input from the community stakeholders, including East Phillips Neighborhood Association uh, Institute, rather the Southside Green Zones Task Force, Native American led community organizations and other community based organizations and residents and B establishing of the development objectives and goals for requests for proposals um, to solicit redevelopment proposals to include significant involvement from the community stakeholders. And then I will just hope that someone uh, in my team will be able to forward um, this to the clerk so that can be submitted. And my apologies on my impression that this had already been previously submitted. And if I can, um, once I, that's been confirmed for submittal and review, I would like to um, briefly speak to, to the motion. Um, thank you, Council Member Reich. Um, I, I have not seen the, the staff direction either. Um, and has it been sent to the clerk's office? That was my impression. Let me just. Oh, I bless. I guess it's just been forwarded. Again, apologies for my assumption on its delivery. All right. So colleagues, we now have the motion before us. And Madam Vice President, if, if I may, as 
folks peruse the um, verbiage, but I just briefly want to outline uh, a few comments. Please. Thank you, Madam Vice President. You know, here I believe, you know, based on all the communication that we've had in terms of the merit of the um, proposed Hiawatha facility and all the purposes entailed in such a project, I think the merits of it are pretty clear, well established, and have been voted on uh, affirmatively uh, through many, many stages uh, over many, many years. So I won't really comment so much on that or belabor those points, but I do think this strikes a balance based on the moment that we took as a, a community and as a body uh, to reflect once again um, on uh, the community perspective on this and the broader goals of our environmental objectives. And so I think we all uh, unanimously welcomed this extra step. And, uh, and I think this is a sort of nod to all of the work um, that went into this additional evaluation, uh, some of it technical and staff as it was presented today, uh, and some of it in terms of community aspirations, but also in terms of our collective will as a, as a body to deliver on our values uh, as an enterprise internally and to do things that are measurably valuable to the city of Minneapolis uh, externally. And I think here we we embed a commitment to continue uh, working with the community members as outlined, uh, the key stakeholders who have stepped up with uh, a certain vision for additional benefits. Um, we will continue to try to enhance uh, additional environmental benefits, but knowing the ground level benefits both metaphorically and figuratively will stay in place with, with this sort of alternative plan B as it's called motion. Um, we get an absolute certainty on pollution remediation. We get an absolute certainty that our goals in terms of our operations are tops in terms of the style of the building and its environmental impact, given that we have to have a minimum lead certified buildings. And the fact that we have fleet commitments, knowing that all enterprises have some level of coming and going that ours will, if not now be best in line for commercial reuse, it is going to be continue to be so by our own staff directions and our own objectives and our own actions of today in terms of modifying our fleet. Um, so on that note, we're advancing community goals and objectives. We're advancing city objectives. And I think this is really the ultimate in taking in new considerations and moving forward with a past commitment to deliver for our city. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Thank you, Councilman Wright. Just for clarity, does this motion eliminate the training facility? It it would initially, but that would be subject to the community and stakeholder input process of which I know there's been recent communications of how those two uh, values and, and proposals might overlap. That would not be precluded in any way, shape or form. And I would hope that those conversations would continue, but that would be subject to work with staff and the stakeholders as identified. Thank you. Council Member Johnson. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. This is really a point of order question. So I looked at Council Member Reich's motion. And I thought, geez, this looks familiar. And it uh, turns out on August 18th at our POGO committee, which this is continued from, we essentially had what at least looks to me like the same motion that was brought forward uh, and it failed. And so Procedurally, are we able to have Councilmember Wright move this motion if it has already failed from a continuation of that committee? Uh, or would he need somebody who voted down the motion to uh, essentially uh, bring this back up? Um, and I, you know, I'm not sure if this is exactly word for word the same as uh, Council or as that motion that failed, but I will note that. Uh, the motion from that committee uh, includes the same language about the three acres, implementing option B, uh, directing staff. And so I, I'm curious, at least procedurally, uh, how that works. And so maybe that's something that the clerk could clarify as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Johnson. And I will ask for some assistance from the city clerk. Uh, Chair Jenkins and, and Council Member Johnson, I, along with everyone else, am just just reviewing this motion uh, live, so I haven't seen this before. I'm looking back at the 
committee report uh, from that meeting, and it does appear the motion is not exactly the same. And and considering that that was, um, you know, considering that the body has not yet taken final action on this item, um, and has new information before it, considering what staff has submitted, I, I think it would be appropriate to be uh, taken as a new motion. Thank you. I appreciate that. It's good to get the clarification. And I'll be uh, just note that I'll be consistent in voting uh, against this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Johnson. Uh, Councilmember Palmasano. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to step out of the way because I think Councilmember Reich, who's in queue after me, maybe wants to respond um, to that request, and maybe I could speak after him. Certainly, uh, Councilmember Wright. Uh, thank you, Madam Vice President. I was just going to comment on my impression of the motion. Uh, I will note that the one substantial um, difference is the um, taking away any sort of uh, extraordinary effort to have an exclusive rights agreement, which clearly was not uh, the intention of the body at that time. Uh, so just want to make that point. Thank you. Councilmember Palmasano. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, well, I don't have um, a problem with this potential direction coming back with that slight modification. It is rather complex. Uh, Councilmember Reich, as he goes into his explanation, um, I think helps the public to appreciate just how many moving pieces there are here and what our obligations are as a city. Um, but I do think that the fact that this is before us again and that it seems that Councilmember Cano and you, Madam Chair, have yet to see this motion again coming up with this new information. Um, you know, we've, it, the council member whose ward it's in has asked for just a bit more time. And this has been ongoing for more than three years. Um, and I just don't understand why then at this point we need to rush this decision now, why we can't give the person whose ward it's in the honor of one more cycle of time to get whatever that might be uh, that needs to be pieced together, um, some new dots connected or partners or whatever that is. Um, so I just wanted to point that out. It's not that I necessarily oppose uh, Councilmember Reich's direction, but I do think this is a bit stepping on the toes of some of the people that are doing the really hard work here. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Palmasano, and I see Council President Binder in queue. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, so the reason that I um, do remind us that we made a decision on this project is that that decision then directed our city staff in a, across the city enterprise in many city departments to do work on the project as directed unanimously by the 13 city council members and the mayor at the time, the same people who are in office today. And every time there is so what is ha has been happening recently is notwithstanding the council's decision to move forward with a version of this project, which is the city council's final decision, a group of council members has been meeting with staff and asking for an enormous amount of staff time to be devoted to changing the direction of that decision. So every cycle, every month, every year that this is delayed, more staff time is going into this, um, doing something that has not been approved by council, that is different from what the council approved. So um, I, so, and for a very long time, I think a lot of us have been trying to get to some kind of compromise or solution forward here that honors the feedback that we're hearing from community that acknowledges all of the trade-offs, the environmental trade-offs of not doing asbestos cleanup, the financial impacts of walking away from a project and spending $12.9 million to get back to nothing, to having um, a site that is then vacant and polluted um, with a, a huge financial burden to the city, 
of having then financial liability related to potential lawsuits from customers, not just in Minneapolis, but in the suburban communities that we serve. And then also to understand the trade-offs of placing a facility in a different part of the city um, and the additional vehicle miles traveled and emissions that would come from that decision to move the facility. And in, in all the conversations that have happened over the years, it, it comes full circle to a point where folks, I think, keep coming back to, um, their, the trade-offs are, are very significant. Um, so the answer to the question, what's the big deal about just waiting two weeks, is it's two more weeks where our CPED director is working on this, our public works director is working on this, our city attorney's office is spending significant time, our finance office is working on this, our sustainability office is working on this. And those are all departments that are both short staffed and have significantly more work because we are in a pandemic and an economic crisis. We are approaching budget season, they're preparing their budget amendments. Um, I'm sure in the back of their heads is what's going to get cut from my department if the city council has to close a $12.9 million budget hole um, because the maximum levy is going to get set very soon. So that will be the only choice. Um, we won't be able to raise property taxes more than the mayor has proposed after the Board of Estimate and Taxation um, sets the maximum levy for this cycle. So there are numerous reasons to make a decision and to give clear direction to the dozens of city staff who repeatedly drop everything to work on this project over and over and over again. And on their behalf, I feel very compelled to, to say that, um, that what I'm hearing um, here is different than what I hear from staff when they contact me about this project. Um, and that there is significant concern from multiple departments about the idea of moving forward with um, the pro the canceling this project. Um, so the reason to make a decision today is to be clear in, in our decision making, to be responsible in our budgeting and to be able to find a way to move forward. Um, one that sets aside a significant amount of land for community use, one that honors future input of community and developing what would happen in that site. Um, and does not create a whole new set of both financial and environmental trade-offs, including a site filled with asbestos, increased vehicle miles traveled from trucks driving through neighborhoods across the city, and the financial impacts of the $12.9 million budget hole. Councilmember Cano. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Um, I will not be supporting the uh, Kevin Reich motion. Um, I've never seen it before. Um, you know, the, the taxpayers that are actively involved in these conversations um, who are living and working in the Ninth Ward haven't seen this language. Um, this would probably be one of the, the worst um, government processes uh, taken up by the city if approved today uh, for the the high um, gap in transparency and um, public due process. So I don't I don't ethically or um, <laughs> professionally I, I couldn't support this motion in any way. Um, I do I do think that um, you know uh, postponement of this. Uh, conversation for another two weeks is not as insurmountable as Councilmember Bender describes. I mean, you're talking to the body who had to wait for her to get back from the boundary waters so we could make a decision on public safety. So the rest of us are here working. Uh, we've been working on this issue for many, many years. Um, you know, in in the face of a lot of different challenges for what is an immigrant, refugee, indigenous, and historically black community. Um, you know, the 
the, I guess the inequity in this whole conversation is really uh, triggering for me, just because I see just how the the weight of the of the white supremacy of the entire city of Minneapolis is being weaponized to shut down uh, conversations with a community who's really who's trying to figure out uh, the future of of their own um, vision and and needs and desires in in a very transformative moment for the city of Minneapolis. And so I, I don't think that that two weeks is as uh, a huge of a problem as what's been presented today. And um, and if we're not here to do the work that is being asked um, by our constituents, our taxpayers, our residents, um, then we shouldn't be here. Um, and, and this is part of the work and um, and we get paid to do this work and city staff get paid to, to ask these questions. And um, we haven't fully or thoroughly answered the question of how this project aligns, supports, or expands our goals around racial equity uh, or the truth and reconciliation process that we all uh, supported uh, that is supposed to center the voices of American Indian people and um, African American community members. Um, so I think that that there's still a lot of uh, things to uh, unpack and to dig into in this conversation. Um, I also feel uh, very, um, I don't know, just very disrespected by the way that this work has been folded out uh, by um, Councilmember Reich, because I would never under any uh, circumstance go to his ward and tell him how to do a project or go to council member, uh, you know, X, Y, and Z's ward and tell them this is how you do Upper Harbor Terminal or this is how you do Northern Metals. And, and trust me, I get people coming to me all the time saying, can you do something? Can you please make this happen? And I always say, no, I have to defer to the council member of that area. I cannot take leadership on an issue that is not what I represent um, or that I've been voted to, to address. Um, and so I, I would just like to express just severe concern with that type of precedent being um, laid out before us. And um, just to go back a, a little bit to some of the conversations with our interim uh, public works director, Mr. Brett Jelly, um, my, my comments regarding the incompleteness of this conversation is related to the fact that many of us know that there's ongoing negotiations and discussions around this topic. Um, it's not about a discrete memo that we asked to be delivered today, but it is about uh, the bigger picture that we're trying to address here, which is, as somebody mentioned, uh, decades and decades worth of, uh, you know, racist urban planning that has created the concentration of uh, urban and pollution in very specific neighborhoods and not by accident um, and, and by really clear actions and directions and patterns of uh, local city making that, that we get the honor and the privilege to rectify and to correct. And so if this feels uh, like a really big conversation that's requiring a lot of attention, it, it's because it is. We are asking ourselves really big questions and we are really trying to figure out how do we stop a neighborhood who has been, uh, you know, functioning as the uh, industrial dumping ground of the city for decades to not be that anymore. And, um, you know, I can already hear interim director Bet Jelly say, yeah, but our, our, you know, our center is not polluting anything. That's not the point here. The bigger question is always missed for the smaller pieces of this. And the bigger question is around a racially concentrated area of poverty that also happens to somehow magically be the most uh, polluted neighborhood in the city um, with yet another project that's going to shove um, hundreds of operating vehicles into the area, increasing the dangerous uh, levels of uh, pollution in an already uh, overburdened neighborhood as identified by our Southside Green Zones policy um, and, and how we can actually solve that problem. 
Um, and, and we did try to have this conversation four years ago and we didn't have the votes. Um, we wanted to have that conversation again because there was new leadership provided by Council Vice President Jenkins as a true racial equity ally in this conversation to open it up again and to re-examine this work through, again, a deeply transformative process that the city is going through. Um, the city of Minneapolis 20 years ago is not the city of Minneapolis today. I mean, we we all experience that. We all live that. And so I just I just want to share just um, the many layers of concerns that I have for uh, what's happening here in this conversation and how it continues. Uh, the narrative continues to be this us versus them thing. And it's like we're all trying to figure this out together. We're all trying to problem solve together. The racial inequities and the institutional racism in this discussion are very clear. And why we're shying away from it is is really confusing to me because we're having those very clear conversations and policing, but yet we're not wanting to have those conversations conversations around environmental uh, issues. Uh, so it's it's um, it's it's very incongruent, you know. It, it doesn't seem consistent, and and you know we can't be a city that's uh, just uh, super progressive on one issue and then completely conservative on a, on another. That that to me just feels really uh, strange. But we can you know we can have these conversations, and and I think that again by having uh, this delayed by one cycle, we can bring forward a fuller picture with uh, many more voices included. And clearly, you know, not supporting this this particular staff direction because of the lack of transparency, engagement, input, not only by the council member who represents the area where this project is, uh, but also because of the many taxpayers from all across the city that have been engaging on this. We received over a thousand comments on the environmental assessment worksheet for this project. Um, over time, I've personally counted 800 emails on this topic alone, and I had to stop counting because it was too much. I couldn't keep up with the volume of people engaging with us on this topic. So I think we can at least give those people just two more weeks uh, to make sure that their voice is heard and that the conversations that we're having can be completed and finalized with the fully and due attention of our very, very um, well-resourced and supported staff members who get paid to do this really hard work uh, for a city that is struggling and that wants to change and that doesn't want to have the same racial inequities that we've had for the last 30 years. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, and I did put myself in queue. Um, I I just want to, first of all, I guess I'll preface my comments by just saying that, it, you know, I think this motion that is on the floor actually brings forth a compromise, and I, I really wish we could get to some kind of compromise with the community to be able to, um, bring forward a, a water maintenance uh, facility that we all benefit from and also offer an opportunity for um, the community members in the um, East Phillips neighborhood to be able to realize a community based um, project to bring forward urban farming ideas and job opportunities and other uh, processes, it, it, it seems like um, that would be the optimal solution. Um, I, I wanted to just comment a little bit um, to Council President Bender's, um, you know, consistent reminders that we, we made a decision on this issue. Um, and as Council Member Connell noted, we're not the same city as we were 20 years ago. I would I would add we're not the same city we were in 2018 when we made that decision, um, and which prompted me for that very reason to 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 re-examine this issue, uh, and that is this. Um, terrible um, virus that is impacting people's abilities to breathe. And one of the uh, 
mantras of this whole racial justice reckoning is the three word statement, I can't breathe. That's literally what we're talking about here. People's ability to breathe. And so metaphorically, this, pro this project represents that and literally it will uh, potentially have impacts on people's abilities to breathe. Um, and so I, I, I do think that, you know, we didn't have a resolution declaring racism as a public health crisis uh, in 2018 when we made this decision. We, we, we weren't grappling with the, the vagaries of a global pandemic that impacts people's respiratory systems. Um, and so I, I thought this issue deserved um, a, a closer re-examination. Um, and I will be um, supporting a delay so that we can continue to try to work out some level of compromise. Um, and I think, um, yeah, these are really, really difficult issues and really difficult decisions that we have to make. And as Council Member Connell noted, that is the, the reason why we get paid is to make these difficult decisions. So um, there's other comments. Council Member Fletcher. Thank you, Vice President Jenkins. And in that spirit, I just I just want to express what a good compromise I think this is. Uh, that I think this option B gives three acres to community to uh, determine the fate of to really uh, create opportunities uh, to imagine what we want to do with a significant piece of urban land. Uh, at the same time, it also shows respect for our workers, uh, not only the workers who would be uh, doing the work to explore uh, extensive uh, you know, potential new uh, scenarios, uh, but also uh, the workers who are currently working in an inadequate facility. And I think there's good evidence that many of them are feeling disrespected by our city right now. Many of them have been working under very difficult conditions during the pandemic. This is one way that we can show respect uh, to the workers of our city by investing in uh, the conditions of their work. Uh, at the same time, uh, that we uh, create space for community, and uh, I'm I'm very supportive of that compromise, uh, which had been well discussed in uh, many previous council meetings. Thank you, Councilmember Fletcher. Um, so we have a subsequent motion, but I'm not sure if there was a second on that motion. I guess maybe there was since we moved to discussion. Kirk, can you remind me if there was a second on that motion? Second. Thank you. There is a second. There was. Council President Bender just moved to second. Thank you. Um, is there any further discussion? Seeing none, um, I will ask the clerk to call the roll on Council Member Reich's second motion. Council Member Reich. Aye. Gordon. Council Member Gordon. No. Fletcher. Aye. Cunningham. Aye. Osman. Aye. Goodman. 
Aye. Connell. Nay. Bender. Aye. Schrader. No. Johnson. No. Palmasano. No. Ellison. Aye. Chair Jenkins. No. There are seven ayes and six nays. So that motion carries. And um, I, I think that would, um, has been noted in the chat, Trump, the original motion which started this conversation to delay. Is that a correct reading of the actions taken, Madam Clerk? Sure, Vice President. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, Peggy and I jumped in again at the same time. I think I think that's a fair interpretation. All right. Um, that item has been dispensed with. And we are moving forward with that staff direction. Um, that has been distributed to the clerk and to our individual inboxes as well. Our next item on our agenda, um, uh, uh, that direction is approved for today and will be forwarded to the full city council uh, on Friday. Item number 38 on our agenda is an update from the Transgender Equity Council. And I will invite Trackenberg Tra from the city coordinator's office, coordinator's office to introduce this item. Thank you, Chair Jenkins, and thank you, Council. Um, my name is Track, and I'm actually going to turn it straight over to the Transgender Equity Council co-chairs to introduce their work. Thank you. Uh, Track, can you introduce the co-chairs? Yes, absolutely. Sorry, they were going to introduce themselves, but I'm happy to. Um, Kenzie and Hunter are the two co-chairs for the Transgender Equity Council. Thank you so much. And Kenzie and Hunter, if you don't mind for the edification of um, myself and my colleagues, can can you just please share um, your pronouns so that we can be able to um, respectfully address that concern? Absolutely, I'll go first. Hi everyone, my name is Hunter Williams. And my pronouns are he, him, they. I am co-chair of the Trans Equity Council, as Track had said. Uh, Kenzie, go ahead. Hi, everyone. I am Kenzie. Uh, I use they, them pronouns. And I am the other co-chair for the Trans Equity Council. Um, so let's just get into it. Um, First of all, thank you for having us today. Um, we wanted to start off by highlighting the work that the TEC has accomplished over the last year um, and the work that remains to be done, um, and that still requires uh, city council action. Um, these recommendations were built by TEC members based on community engagement processes over the past four years. Many of these recommendations reiterate asks the TEC has previously made. We are presenting them earlier in the year this time, as some of them include small asks around the 2022 budget. I wanted to get them to you before markup season got too busy. Our recommendations encompass housing, community safety and healing, training, restrooms, and the general role of city appointed boards.
Uh, next slide, please. This is Hunter. So we want to start by updating you all on the work that we've done within each category of our recommendations. So with regards to housing, since we last presented to the city council six months ago, the TEC has worked with regulatory services to develop anti-discrimination content in their trainings for property owners. Regulatory services will soon be piloting an anti-discrimination webinar. The Transgender Issues Work Group has also worked with staff in various departments to develop trans equity guidelines that can be applied to city contracts with shelters and other social service providers. So moving forward, we continue to echo many of the Minneapolis Advisory Committee on Housing's asks. We recommend that the City Council expand shelter opportunities, prioritize creating and preserving deeply affordable housing, and take action to improve the quality of rental properties. Specifically, we recommend that the City Council adopt the tenant opportunity to purchase ordinance, the City Council support community leadership, developing affordable trans-specific housing and opportunities in Minneapolis. And the City Council provide more staffing support for regulatory services so that they can expand their property owner training and make it mandatory. Regulatory services would need overtime pay for existing inspectors who conduct, conduct these trainings and or funding for an additional training role. Next slide, please. When it comes to community safety and healing, we would like to highlight the TEC's work providing feedback to the city's transforming community safety, community engagement process, development of a partnership with the Office of Violence Prevention, and work with intergovernmental relations uh, to add protections for LGBTQ plus community members to our legislative agenda. We further highlight the continued growth of the Trans Equity Summit. The summit attracts hundreds of attendees each year from both within and outside of Minneapolis and provides opportunities for healing, learning, and connection for all attendees. Um, next slide, please. Moving forward, we echo our high level asks for funding to be moved from MPD towards resources for BIPOC, trans, GNC community members, especially those who are currently or formerly incarcerated. This could look like legal, mental health and employment services, guaranteed basic income and funny funding for the city's trans equity work, amongst other things. Specifically, we recommend. I, I'm, I'm sorry, Kinsey, can I just interrupt you for one second? Someone is talking and they're not on mute. Can we please mute that conversation? Thank you very much. All right, so um, getting it in right into the recommendations, uh, we recommend that the City Council expand the mobile behavioral health crisis response pilot as sufficient funding would help ensure faster response times for mental health crisis calls. The City Council fund the exploration of alternatives to police response for other problem nature codes that do not statutorily require a police response. The City Council support the creation of a Department of Race and Equity and fund the department sufficiently to carry out all programming outlined in the department ordinance. This should include increased funding for the trans equity programming as the summit currently costs $30,000 at minimum, not counting other programming throughout the year and is being funded primarily by the contributions of organizations tabling at the Career and Resource Fair. In addition, Increased trans equity funding could cover the cost of an urban scholar or step up intern to develop a local resource list for trans residents, which we are regularly asked for. 
We ask for the trans equity budget to be increased from 15,000 to $30,000 ongoing, plus funding for one summer intern role. Uh, the city council instruct the city attorney's office to look into the possibility of safe use sites in Minneapolis. Uh, this is direct feedback from a community listening session on the trans equity work. Um, city council direct contract managers and attorneys for social services contracts over 100,000 or 175,000, if not ongoing, to incorporate trans equity requirements in their future requests for proposals. This work is already in process, but requires council support for staff to prioritize it. Program managers should report back to council by the end of 2022 with updates on the project's progress. The city council and relevant departments use city property and or funding to provide a location for a queer and trans community center. Community center would provide positive youth development opportunities and accesses to resources in line with the city's violence prevention goals and the public safety strategic and racial equity action plan priorities. City Council work with the Mayor's Office, Civil Rights and Procurement to include LGBTQ owned, disabled owned and veteran owned business enterprises in the city's definition of supplier diversity. City Council work with intergovernmental relations to include a LGBTQ plus panic defense bill and protections of queer and trans residents on their legislative agenda. The City Council supports Sunu Shrestha's blueprint to end human trafficking, specifically the recommendations around decriminalizing sex work, cannabis slash addiction, homelessness, poverty, and mental illness. Immediately, we recommend that the City Council repeal the loitering ordinance, which disproportionately targets BIPOC and trans residents and uses a significant amount of police time to answer calls where the person in question is often gone by the time that the cops arrive. City Council continue the guaranteed basic income pilot funded by ARPA phase one. San Francisco has piloted a universal basic income proposal specifically for trans residents. We encourage City Council to research and pursue a similar proposal. City Council continue to encourage the Office of Violence Prevention to take on more trans and gender non-conforming specific work. Immediately, City Council could fund a contract management and administrative role specific to OVP. This would free up valuable staff time to develop the new sexual assault and domestic violence response role, which OVP staff intend to collaborate with the TC on. The City Council could also increase funding to the OVP fund as that is OVP's most flexible funding source for community programming. City Council continue to encourage HR to distribute the city's trans equity in the workplace survey as soon as possible. This will help create a better work environment for trans and GNC employees, therefore improving the city's work on all of the previously mentioned outcomes. City Council commission a study of best practices in city government policy for trans equity. In developing these recommendations, we searched for a compilation of best policies from other jurisdictions, but found that no such compilation exists, so we would love for it to come from Minneapolis. Next slide, please. So in the last year, the TEC has worked with HR to select new contractors for the city's Gender Inclusivity 101 training and will pilot the training in the next few weeks before it's rolled out across the enterprise. Broadly, we recommend an expansion of the training opportunities that exist for both city staff and those we contract with. Specifically, we recommend Three things. The City Council increased the HR learning and development budget by $10,000 with the specific purpose of funding not only an introductory level trans equity training, but also a deeper dive follow up. The City Council instruct HR staff to expand their advertising strategies for the Gender Inclusivity 101 training. 
And thirdly, the city council provide $7,500 annually to Minneapolis employment and training to support two introductory LGBTQ competency trainings and one advanced level LGBTQ competency training for their providers. Minneapolis employment and training staff presented to the TEC earlier this year about their plans to better support LGBTQ community and we collectively identified these trainings as a first step. Next slide please. All right, every trans person favorite, their favorite topic is bathrooms. So over the last six months, the TEC has worked with CPED and council staff to add language encouraging all gender restroom construction and equitable bathroom access to the city's single room occupancy ordinance. Um, we'd like to thank all council offices that were involved in making that happen. Um, we also had conversations with CPED around how they could more effectively encourage all gender bathroom construction on new builds, but we have not reached actionable next steps. Um, overall, we seek to create a Minneapolis with more all gender restrooms and more confirmation of equitable and safe restroom access for residents um, using gendered bathrooms as well. So specifically, we recommend that City Council encourage equitable bathroom access in non-city buildings by directing civil rights staff to promote know your rights type materials on the topic. The City Council instruct community planning and economic development staff to recommend all gender bathroom construction on new builds when meeting with business owners and architects requesting permits from the city. CPED staff can also determine which other licensing or permitting meetings should involve a conversation about gender neutral bathrooms as well. Uh, following the example set in Philadelphia, which has required all single stall restrooms in city retail establishments to be gender neutral, the city council should instruct the attorney's office to research the legal parameters for adopting this or a similar policy here. Um, and we're excited to see that council member Schroeder is already working on this. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the role of appointed boards. So over the past six months, the TEC has provided feedback to numerous city departments via presentations in our monthly meetings. We wanna see a city infrastructure that takes our appointed boards and commissions seriously, actualizes their recommendations and gives them the tools they need to succeed. Specifically, we recommend that City departments should continue to use the TEC and other appointed boards and commissions as a resource and consult us on policy and engagement work. The City Council direct the clerk's office to develop a directory, listserv, or other infrastructure in compliance with open meeting law that would support members of different ABCs in collaborating with each other and more easily sharing feedback. None of our work exists in a vacuum and all of our work would benefit from collaboration. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, I can imagine you all are pretty tired at this point in the meeting. I know I am. There's been a lot of discussion up until this point. But again, this is another way that our power and impact is limited by the system. It feels like it's limited based on how the structure of these agendas are built and it doesn't feel fair. Just wanted to add that. Um, Kenzie, do you have anything you'd like to add? I think you said it best, Hunter. All right, well, um, we're available for questions. Um, well, I wanna thank you both and all the members of the TEC for these recommendations. They're very well thought out and very much um, uh, 
uh, aligns with many of the thoughts and ideas that uh, are are that I know are present here on the council. Um, I certainly um, support many of the the proposals brought forth here or ideas brought forth within this proposal and um, appreciate uh, the work that track does to support the trans equity council and all of all of its members for um, for bringing these ideas forward to the city council so thank you thank you both um, and I guess I would just um, ask if you can just mention a little bit about the trans equity summit that's coming up in a couple of weeks anybody we're actually Absolutely. gonna give that over to track they've been doing a lot of really hard work on the trans equity summit thank you kenzie yep we were just coordinating for a second who was going to take that but thank you cvp jenkins um and thank you all Yep, the Trans Equity Summit is this year is our eighth annual summit um, and it's going to be Sunday, October 3rd and Monday, October 4th, um, both virtually and in person um, with ways to participate both ways, depending on folks COVID comfort um, and in person programming is happening at the Minneapolis Institute of Art. Um, the theme this year is routes to joy, community and social change and Registration info and all of the info about the summit is on the city's website. Thank you for reminding us to plug that also. Thank you so much. Um, I see we have a question or a comment from Council Member Schrader. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Track, uh, Kinsey, and Hunter for this report, and, and especially for your comments at the end. I think we really uh, try to hold our city and ourselves accountable um, to the, you know, the good intentions we have around equity, and that includes uh, being accessible um, to to anyone in the public. I um, also want to thank you very much uh, for all of these uh, recommendations uh, for the future, as well as what we can do right now. Um, and in that spirit, I'd like to bring forward a staff uh, direction. Uh, if the clerk can put that up on the screen. Sure, so this would be a staff direction directing staff from the Division of Race and Equity in the City Coordinator's Office to convene and staff a work group that would include staff from the City Attorney's Office, uh, Civil Rights Department, uh, Community Planning and Economic Development Department, Finance and Property Services, and the members of the Transgendered Issues Working Group to evaluate the authority, feasibility, and implementation steps involved with the, with the city requirement that in all single stall restrooms in, in city-owned operated buildings and city licensed buildings to be gender neutral. And the work group shall report back on the, to the biz committee or its successor committee, uh, depending on where we are in our COVID recovery um, in the first quarter of 2022. So I'd like to move this forward for approval. Uh, thank you, Council Member Schrader. Is there a second? Uh, I'll second. Council Member Cunningham, thank you. Um, so we do uh, have a, a motion before us, a staff direction um, offered by Council Member Schrader. Um, fortunately, Council Member Schrader, we, we actually have a team that is already formulated and to and they can take up this issue. I think the only member of that of the transgender work group that we would have to add would be potentially CPED. I just can't remember what the formulation is and maybe someone from finance and property services. But um, I, I, I do believe that that work um, can get done. So I will ask the clerk to call the roll on this, if, unless there's any further discussion. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilmember Reich. Aye. Gordon. Councilmember Gordon. Fletcher. Cunningham. Aye. Osmond. Aye. Goodman. Aye. Cano. 
Bender. Schrader. Aye. Johnson. Palmisano. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Gordon. Connell. Bender. Johnson. Chair Jenkins. Aye. There are eight ayes. That item carries. And I will just note um, to your point, uh, Hunter, you know, the um, sort of order of our agendas um, are challenging and, and the discussions that we frequently have can be long. And so um, several colleagues had indicated that they had they needed to leave for for other obligations, other meetings, et cetera. Um, and so consequently, um, you know, people have left. Um, it, it is a challenge to, um, you know, have these conversations in a timely manner. And uh, your point is very, very well taken and will be very much considered in the future. Council Member Cunningham. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to make sure to say a big thank you to the Trans uh, Transgender Equity Council members. Uh, every year that you all come and do a presentation to the City Council, it's always thorough. There's always a great analysis behind it, always very well presented. So I just want to make sure to raise and praise the work that you all put in to this. These are really good concrete uh, recommendations. That's, I'll just say that, you know, as a council member, this is the best kind of work that can come out of an advisory committee because we love very clear guidance <laughs> as policymakers. It makes our job a lot easier than having to try to guess. Um, and so being able to hear directly from folks in the community, um, what are the best things for us to focus on? And I'm grateful to council member Schrader for bringing this forward, although he beat me to it because I was going to be bringing it forward. Um, so thank you for your leadership uh, for that uh, council member Schrader. But there are lots and lots of other good recommendations that I look forward to working with you all on. So thank you for your leadership. Uh, thank you for um, holding us accountable, and I look forward to partnering with you in the work. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Councilmember Cunningham. And again, thank you to the, the TEC. This is a model of how advisory committees um, can and, and should function in the city of Minneapolis. And so I echo all of Councilmember Cunningham's praise. And with that, um, we have concluded all the business to come before our committee today. And if there are no objections, I will declare this meeting adjourned. And I just want to thank you all, all of my colleagues um, and the presenters for um, a really uh, great meeting discussion um, and and outcomes. So have a great rest of the day, everyone.